Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event tonight with VLAB. VLAB is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit that for 30 years has been connecting innovators, investors, experts, and curious minds, exploring disruptions, inflection points, and finding insights from founders before their household, household names. Tonight's event is focused on the shift to electric vehicles. It's a sector that's growing enormously fast and upending an enormous industry. I'm excited to hear more about it tonight from those most closely involved. And before we do, a few words of thanks. First, to all of our donors. Many of you made donations for tonight. Thank you for providing the support we need to run the organization. And to all of our VLAB volunteers, without you, there's no events. So specifically, thank you to this event volunteer team. I'm so proud of the work you did to bring this panel into existence tonight. Huge thanks to Brian Caldero, um, Bill Lee for all of your support and help, and Andres Mar Marquez, you two are, are amazing. Um, but Brian, without you and Kuldeep and um, Shizu Munakata with the inspiration, uh, this event would not be happening. So thank you to all the rest of our volunteers and especially to our um, core team, Bob Giulino for marketing, David Ham, vice chair, and everyone else. Um, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our moderator tonight, John McElroy, who is with Autoline.tv. I grew up in Detroit, and I'll say that if you don't know who John is, you should. Um, he will introduce the rest of the panelists and explain far more than I can about the topic. So without further ado, John, please take it away. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, VLabs, and welcome, everybody. We got a terrific panel here tonight to dive into the automotive industry's transition to electric vehicles. The race is on. And the underlying theme for tonight's panel discussion is whether we're talking about legacy automakers or startups, who's going to make it to the checkered flag? So let me take a couple of minutes to introduce you to the panel. Volker Kesa is the chief technology officer of Indigo Tech. They've developed an intriguing EV that's developed suspension corners with hub motors that deliver all the power, but they also integrate the steering and the suspension into that. That allowed them to open up the interior of the vehicle so it has a lot of interior volume, but with a much smaller footprint. And better still, it looks really cool. Then we've got Chris Anthony, the CEO of Aptera. They're coming out with a futuristic two-seat electric cars with solar panels on the roof. And yes, the Aptera can literally run on sunshine up to 40 miles a day. Aptera is also on the bleeding edge of what I would call the new mobility. Small, lightweight, low-cost cars that are a counterweight to the kind of cars that are being made today. Dave Lyons truly fits the definition of a serial entrepreneur. He's seen it all. And most famously, he started at Tesla in 2004 as employee number 12 and rose to become the director of engineering. He's been involved in so many startups that I'm not even going to try to list them now because they're, we'd be here all night. And then next, we've got the money guy. Uh, hold on a second. I'm getting somebody trying to call me here because I didn't put my plane in airplane mode, my, my phone in airplane mode. Okay, next, we've got the money guy, Alexi Andreev, who's the managing director of Autotech Ventures. That's the venture capital firm that specializes in early stage funding for companies that are trying to solve ground transportation problems all over the world. And that includes all the different technologies that can play a role in what we're going to be talking about tonight. And then finally, we've got Sandy Monroe, the CEO of Monroe and Associates and a root YouTube rock star that probably makes him the best known guy in the automotive industry that tears down vehicles for competitive benchmarking. Sandy and his team provide automakers with insights and opportunities into what they can do with their products and their companies. So let's kick off this blue ribbon panel of experts here. And Sandy, why don't you lead the way? As you evaluate all these EV startups, what are some of the top things that you think people and entrepreneurs need to look at to figure out if these companies are going to make it to the checkered flag? Well, the um, the checkered flag is going to be uh, what everybody's going to be trying for. But right now, what I'm seeing is a stumbling um, with lots and lots and lots of good ideas. Unfortunately, not a hell of a lot of money. And so consequently, 
I think uh, money is the mother's milk of uh, of the industry. You you can't survive without cash. So the big thing for me is we're watching the economy kind of falter. We're looking at interest rates that are headed for the moon. For me, the biggest uh, the biggest stumbling block for some of the cars that I've been looking at, actually, and just not cars, VTOLs. There's all kinds of electric uh, vehicles that are uh, that are that are going to be coming into the marketplace. Money seems to be the big thing. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to start off asking um, what what does a company have to do in order to um, in order to entice uh, some some cash, if you like, infusions. And what what is that going to do to these uh, these companies? Is it going to kill them completely? Because that I think will will kill off uh, a lot of the industry. So I'd like to talk a little bit, or I'd like to hear a little bit about where the money is going to come from. How is it going to be uh, distributed? What kind of interest rates are we going to see? And how are they going to pay it back? That that to me is a big. That's the big question. Well, that that tees it up perfectly for you, Alexi. You know, come on yeah. in. What, what what do you say to what yeah, you're asking about? I, I I think it's a very tough one, uh, Cindy. And uh, Dave and I we we went to the same business school, and we've known each other for over twenty years. And so the funny thing in business schools, they teach capital deployment. What do you do with capital once you have it? How to spend it on engineering, how to spend on marketing, how to spend on operations, how to spend on product development. And somehow they're not teaching people how to form capital. No one talks mm -hmm. about capital formation. You're coming out of the B school, you assume your corporations has unlimited amount of money and all you need to do is to spend capital wisely. And so I think over the last 12 months, we unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, transitioned from abundance of capital to clearly severe shortage of capital. And, and we see rounds getting repriced, and we see public investors who were willing to take venture capital risks and, and buying into SPACs because SPAC was a very clever way of offload venture great risk to retail investors. And, and all in compliance with Security Exchange Commission rules and regulations. I'm not telling somebody violated the, the law in any shape and form, but clearly there was a massive risk transfer from professional investor community into retail and public investor community. And so money are not available anymore. And uh, at this point of time, you are dealing with early stage guys and we're predominantly early stage people. Uh, trying to figure out what can we invest and where our, let's call it, five to $10 million check makes a difference. And unfortunately, the capital intense uh, startups like EVs, they're not a good fit with people like Autotech who can write five to $10 million check. As, as you said, you need to secure massive amounts of money. And historically, you would have several sources. I don't know, guys, you, you probably know it better than me. First, Department of Energy used to write credit facilities, and that's how Tesla started and benefited from. I think they, would, they wouldn't be around without this uh, support from uh, Department of Energy and US government. And very similar things are happening in clearly in South Pacific Asia and China and many other countries where the governments are stepping up and saying, you know what, I see enough merits in your solution and I'm willing to provide some financing options for you. Uh, another source of capital, you go to environmentally, let's call it conscious and, and impact investors and you have mega funds started by zillionaires and they want to change the world and, and protect the environment. And I think those guys have ability to tap into multi-billion dollar pools of capital. In many cases, three, four, five billion of capital can be secured here and there. Or you go to strategics and you explain large players, whether they are existing OEMs or they tier ones, why a particular project is sufficiently mature and why they should expand and either acquire very clever engineering, strong IP, brand, or just the team which can turn it around. 
I frankly don't see venture capitalists uh, uh, be very active in EV space uh, in the next, let's call it 18 to 24 months. And, and money comes and they go in waves. And I think it's one of the waves now where traditional financial investors, institutional investors are hiding under the table, trying to figure out what the hell is going on with interest rates and what 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 the hell is going on with liquidity and public market receptivity for new exits. So I Dave, don't have any good news. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Dave, you've been at so many startups. How do you see it? Is is capital formation, i.e. generating revenue, the most important thing? Certainly feels that way. Boy, you know, um, wasn't a Tesla, but uh, I, I started a company that did self-driving truck technology. And we raised $85 million. And, and in my, you know, kind of venture back startup world, $85 million used to be a fair amount of money, right? But we weren't able to close the three, four, five hundred million dollar rounds five years ago that really allowed some of these people to keep going. And, and that's in the autonomy, but uh, in, I mean that's like I said, that's table stakes. And um, and you know, at the end of the day, the kind of people who are going to place those bets are not the same people who are placing the bets on you in the beginning. So there's a transition phase. You've got you've got to figure out a way to be really attractive to you know almost kind of seed stage investors to get you to convince to take the small money to get you started to reach to mitigate the risk to get to the next stage to get to the next larger stage and it's a different kind of person um, or a different kind of leadership team who can who can do that so it's 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 very challenging to sit down and say who's who's the kind of individual who can take that from the earliest vision all the way through kind of leading it to maybe even launch a first product if you're looking at billion dollar raises or more um i you know you know we we, we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of a lot of carnage yeah Mm -hmm. chris you're you're right on the edge there right i mean you guys are getting ready to start (laughs) selling vehicles soon enough you got to start generating that revenue what do you think what these guys have been saying uh, on the edge is how it always feels in a startup, right? On the edge, <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, fundraising is always a battle. Uh, this is my eighth startup. So I've been through the fundraising ringer, um, you know, on things that I funded myself, uh, things that I've gotten money from other people to fund, things that I've raised big capital for. Uh, but uh, Aptera has been extremely uh, fortunate to kind of evolved at a time where there's this thing called crowdfunding now. So, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't have invested in uh, the early Tesla and supported Dave's uh, ambitions to make the the first uh, you know electric vehicles happen. Um, you know, you had to be rich, <laughs> you had to be in a fund, you had to you know be of means to participate in that world. Uh, but now, uh, if you have more than a thousand bucks in your pocket, uh, you can invest in great companies like Aptera or companies in biotech or companies in tech tech. Uh, you know, it's really cool now that uh, that people can kind of vote uh, for the future they want uh, with their dollars, and uh, it's completely completely changed the fundraising game for us. I so mean, Chris, what's, what's the key? What, what do you need to do to get people to start really giving you money? Yeah. I mean, for us, it's, uh, it's telling the story. Uh, we're, 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 we're espousing a vision for the future that is more efficient and solar powered. Uh, and we have 15,000 amazing investors that have come in and said, I want to be a part of that vision. Uh, I think the vision is much more important than the product uh, for, for crowdfunding because you want people to support, you know, the, the why, of of what you're doing, uh, not really, you know, the the result uh, of that. If your why is pure, uh, the result uh, will be pure as well. That's how we feel uh, about our vehicle. But it's a, uh, you know, uh, it's not for everybody. Uh, not everybody has a business model that probably fits uh, with crowdfunding. Uh, there's probably lots of people that are working on uh, very important things uh, to make the world a better place uh, that aren't really maybe inspiring uh, for a pub- public story. Uh, but we have, you know, a flashy, uh, you know super unique looking solar powered electric vehicle. So uh, I think people uh, people have come around um, and really supported that. But I, I've i played the game where I've went to Sand Hill Road and I've, you know, I've, I've peddled the business plan. I've, I've, you know, met with hundreds and hundreds of venture capital people. Uh, I've had the door slammed in my face uh, more than I care to admit, um, you know, but it's uh, in, in, in those games, you know, it's every no gets you closer to a yes, um, you know, but uh, but in the crowdfunding game, it's if you don't like our story, you know, you're on to the next web page 
page or next video or whatever. Um, if you're inspired by our story, then you dig in and you're like, oh, you know, I, I can not only reserve my own Aptera, I can invest in this company too. So I think it, uh, it will change the game for a lot of startups, um, you know, and hopefully it'll, you know, give us and other companies the leverage to get to a point where we can ask for those really big checks, uh, you know, to support kind of the billions uh, dollar vision that we have, you know, for the growth of this vehicle. Uh, but I would, uh, I would say the game has changed and the VCs and the big institutional capital people, they, they don't like not being able to participate um, in some of these really cool startups because uh, it's just different now. And Walker, we, we need to get you in on this too. I mean, uh, you guys have come out with this uh, really cool looking electric car. You're doing something different. You're bringing something new to the party, these intelligent corners. You've uh, got interior volume in a very small package. How easy is it for you to go out and get the money that you need to bring this to market? Uh, so uh, the general climate and fundraising uh, the last days is not the easiest one. Um, but uh, to be honest, our CEOs at the moment uh, traveling all the uh, companies, VCs who want to fund us. So we are closing at the moment uh, around um, exactly to start off with our engineering. And this will lead us um, to our um, um, tools. Um, it's uh, always like challenging. I have been on the other side in the corporate for 20 years with VWs and startups came to us and said, we have a great technology. And uh, the game was like, we as innovation managers has to say yes or no. And then a fully different animal took over the AM and a guy. And he looks only like the financials. And I like when Chris says he's uh, with his product, uh, he's hard in this. And uh, the financial guys just look in, check out, okay, this is a growth path. Uh, what is the vision in there? And uh, you have to sell to, to different people. So um, as Sandy already said, you have people who are investing in the early phase of a startup. They want to have a great product. And then the fully different kind of investors come in. They want to be part of the growth story. They invest in a plant, in a rollout, in a sales. So um, if you're pitching, you always have to look, who is this guy there? And uh, what is he buying? Not what I can sell him because we are selling always the same story. We leave in our product. We do not change our pitch for, for someone. But uh, it's very important to know what this guy likes to finance. Uh, a vision the early phase or really is a growth path later. Fully different people. And if you put it wrong, you're not in a hole. You just think in there, you're, you're gone. So, Walker, you, you worked at Volkswagen. I mean, they're pouring, I don't know how many tens of billions of euros into going to electric cars. Here you've got this little startup thing going with Indigo. What's the mindset that it takes from somebody with the, the industry background that you have from the legacy side to take this company and get to the checkered flag? Yeah, so I, I've been 20 years uh, with VW. I made the transition of Audi from ICEs to EVs uh, with a budget of 1.5 billion. This is a quite small budget. If you know, VW all in had uh, put 50 billion on this bed of EVs. Um, what uh, triggered me is like, I have been so many years in the industry and uh, the innovators, the dilemmas is to do again and again what you know, why you have success. This is in our mind. It's nothing about automotive guys. You do what you know and where you have success. But uh, to change the world, as Chris said, to have some impact, to do something different, uh, you have to jump out of this box and go a fully new path. So my daughter told me after 20 years with CW, Dad, you're telling us, after three years, the same stories. What's going on? You're the innovation manager of Audi. And I told her, great. This was all just last year. And uh, I met uh, Will Braylon, our CEO of Indigo, lived two weeks with him in the house. And uh, we learned to, to value each other. Uh, I'm a technical guy. He's a fintech guy. He did four amazing startups. And I said, this guy can do startup. I can do uh, cars. So let's put it together. And uh, this was exactly the turning point in my life. Uh, I had two more years in corporate just to say, okay, then I sell uh, to the sunset. And I decided, no, this is now the chance to have some impact. And I like uh, the stories like Chris Vaughan. He's a little bit ahead of us. Um, just bring these new EVs to the market. And what changed my mind is make something different. It's um, right hailing It's B2B, uh, not an owning concept. Um, to have a car which will change. So at the moment, EVs are like big two and a half, three, four tons. 
this is not the volume people are buying. So we have a tight, small car, which is a quite low price, price point of our estimated 30,000 US dollars. And we want to bring this to mass adoption. Um, at the moment, EVs are like, if you have, I don't want to name now some, but uh, they are getting bigger and bigger. And uh, this is uh, on the other side as well, not good for the environment. So if you transport a lot of mass, you already had put a lot of material in there, which is rare. We don't talk about rare earth now, uh, lithium cobalt, etc. And you put a lot of mass around it to transport these heavy batteries. So our idea is to smart, small and stay small. So uh, do more with less. Yeah, may may ask a follow-up question by any chance. Go. And so for, for investors, everything is about pattern recognition. It's very hard to come up with a new idea. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people, and that's how we think internally. You want to find the next Tesla, or you want to find the next Rivian. And so, guys, going to, yeah, yeah, to Chris and, and Volker and maybe Dave, what do you think is the essence of next Tesla or, or next Rivian? What separates those companies from everybody else? What, as investors, we should be looking for? Yeah, I, I'm happy to jump in first. You know, I, I think uh, you know those that uh, want to be the next Tesla should uh, should in Elon we trust. Um, you know, he espouses first principles engineering. Um, you know, how do you get to the root of the problem? And uh, you know, I think at Aptera, uh, that's that's what we did. We uh, we said, where does the energy go in transportation? Uh, if you want to minimize your impact on the planet, you want to minimize the materials you use to build your transportation device. That means you got to be efficient every mile. If you can get down below 100 watt hours per mile, that means you can do a lot with a very small battery pack. You can start to do cool things like solar charging your vehicle. Um, you know, you have a lot, you know, lighter weight vehicle. So you don't have, you know, these uh, brake uh, parts that need uh, servicing, you know, million mile brake life. Um, you know, we have motors that are in our wheels and only have one wearable component, the axle bearing. It's a million mile device. Uh, so we think, you know, um, you know, stepping into first principles engineering and then creating a really compelling solution um, is kind of the next step. I think it's something that Elon probably wanted to do from inception, uh, but he kind of uh, evolved into uh, his company. Um, and, you know, it, it Tesla was 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 up and going before he got there and he just uh, he just pushed, pushed, pushed. Uh, but I think if you asked Elon, hey, if you had to do it all over again. You know, how, how would Tesla look? Uh, and I think he might say, well, it might look something like Aptera. <laughs> well, here's the question for you guys. I mean, perfect. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. <laughs> but, you know, don't forget that Tesla lost billions of dollars for about a decade. And they were able to keep going because Elon Musk is Elon Musk, right? And he can pick up the phone today and get, raise another $2 billion if he has to. I'm not sure any other startup is going to have that kind of grace period of losing so much money for so long. So what's it going to take for the followers who want to be the next Tesla yeah. to be able to pull it off? Well, I think, first off, you're going to have to have something like a Tesla. You're going to have to have something that is so radically different than anything else in the marketplace that uh, that you're going to be able to attract those guys with billions of dollars. And and quite frankly, um, I think that everybody, everybody all, uh, on this panel right now is, you know, they're going to do just fine. But what is the next big thing? I think <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be popular here, but I think it's going to be to move into the third dimension. And uh, VTOLs right now, electric VTOLs are hot stuff. And guess what Elon Musk has come out with? He wants to talk about a supersonic VTOL. I have no idea how to do that. I've worked on lots of planes. When when uh, when uh, uh, when Boeing said, "Hey, uh, we need to have a new aircraft," um, there were five people on the project, and two of them were from me and and Dan McCarthy from Monroe and Associates. I, I know a lot about supersonic. I don't know how to do a supersonic VTOL, but I will tell you <laughs> that the third dimension, especially when you start going into something like New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, any place where it's just hell to get from point A to point B, hey, you know what? The sky is the limit. And quite frankly, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Delta 
has just put in a great big giant order to a company called um, Jobby. And Joby. their job Joby. will be Joby, Joby right. Jobby. Yeah. For me, it's Jobby. I, I was a Jobby. I was, <laughs> I, was a, uh, I was a job shopper. Anyhow, they're flying from the airport to the center of the city in all kinds of areas. Then they're starting with New York's different airports. Then they're going to L.A. Then they're going to go to Atlanta. And I think number five or six is Detroit. Now, that is going to be that's I think that's radically different. Nobody's in there. I think it could be, yeah, that could be the next big thing. But but that's kind of like my view. I don't know. Uh, but Sandy, we have seen this already. We remember CS 2018, Uber <laughs> helicopter traveling yep. in a long line, uh, something like the Vietnam picture, helicopter yep. after helicopter in a traffic jam in the air. Yeah, they waited to get down at uh, Las Vegas airport again. And uh, this will be something interesting for, for investors, for rich guys. We are looking for a change in impact and volume. So we are looking for where our lever is, where a lot of people go in. If you have some guys who are driving a Bugatti, I engineered parts in a Bugatti. I still have parts in there. I love it. But uh, this has uh, not an impact, big impact uh, on uh, sustainability, but not in the bad way, not in the good way. <laughs> but we are looking for for not a fun project of rich people tra traveling faster to somewhere. We are looking for that a lot of people have a difference. And what we are doing, Chris is doing, we are doing, we have a new electric vehicle architecture. We are not doing, again, the same thing, front hood, engine, compartment, maybe a lot bit behind it. No, we are looking to maximize what is on this footprint so we are putting the wheels to the corner. We have this amazing interior room. And uh, Chris is doing something same again. He wants to do the most efficient vehicle. So we have uh, all a high efficiency there. This is uh, the game. And to, to keep something in the air costs more energy to roll it down on the ground. So to be honest, uh, I have been in the Ehan drones in 2015, one of the first innovation managers of the West in China. And uh, I have visited a lot of these EV startups. I have been behind this uh, project at Audi when we did this with Airbus in detail design. Uh, we showed it uh, at, at the Geneva show. It, it, it's an amazing project. I love it. But it's a small spot of premium transportation. Uh, so it's a big game. A lot of people look to it, but it won't change the world, not in good and bad. It's hey, Alexi, what problems. do you think? I'd like to say something, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, jump in. Yeah, yeah. At the, at the end of the day, right, you say we, we got to do something radically different and and uh, like like Tesla was, but Tesla wasn't radically different, to be honest with you. Aptera was around back then too. That was radically different then. No offense, Chris, or, but but I, what what it was, was it brought like, it brought a thrill, like acceleration never gets old. I love that phrase, right? Acceleration never gets old and it allows you to kind of have that. So there was a user experience side to this. And I think the next big, the next big car company is going to have something that really creates a better ownership, like kind of emotional feeling, kind of the same way Apple did when it brought out all of its kind of break, you know, breakthrough products over its whole life. I don't believe it's going to be necessarily doesn't have to be something that's exciting because I love what you're talking about, Sandy. I like I, you know, Joe Ben and I go back pretty far, and and um, I I think it's awesome to get to do an EV EV tall, but I don't think it's going to change the auto industry or the EVs necessarily yet. Well, the thing is, I mean, what we're looking at and and what uh, what I think Volker was talking about was the move toward um, uh, the average person who doesn't have sixty five or eighty five thousand dollars or one hundred and ten thousand like I'm looking at right here. They don't have that kind of money. And so Henry Ford came up with a car that everybody could afford. And guess what? It didn't have acceleration, but. Uh, it didn't have horse shit either. <laughs> so <laughs> it was exact. That's why we got cars, right? It, it got sure. rid of a problem. It got rid of horse pollution. And that that was what everybody wanted to get rid of. So yeah. what we have to do is now we have to get rid of air pollution. We have to get rid of uh, things like the, the, to the, the toxic stuff that we kind of ignore and say, oh, we always done it that way. So I believe that the the cars like what you're seeing uh, i 
I'm I'm getting uh, I'm getting one of the Apterica vehicles. Um, there's no uh, no secret. I've invested in it as well because I think it's got a a fabulous future. And what is it doing? Well, it's getting rid of gasoline. It's getting rid of maintenance. It's getting rid of uh, actually electricity because I'm going to get it for free from the sun. So at the end of the day, this is the kind of stuff that that uh, that the Henry Ford umbrella. How do I get it for a good price? How do I get it so that the average person can, can afford it and to get it into the industry? But I thought we were talking about revolution, and I'm and so I'm I'm still looking for George Jetson. Where the hell's my uh, my flying car? That's yeah, what I yeah. want. Yeah. So, so let, 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 let's hear it from sure, Alexi, sure. because Alexi, you got the money. You're looking at all this future uh, technology that's coming down the road, but you're focused on ground transportation, right? So yeah. two questions for me here. What do you think about VTOLs? Is that making you change your mind about concentrating on uh, ground transportation? And if it's not, what do you see as the next big thing? So I'm, I'm personally in love with VTOLs. I'm, I'm tracking every single company I can find. And, and I, I'm, I'm having regular conversations. And by the way, at the Palo Alto Airport, there is one sitting in the hangar as, as we speak now, which will be revealed this week to the journalists. And I walked around and they didn't allow me to take pictures, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful one. And so if you want to go and check it out, please do so. Yeah, my uh, our our fund is specifically focused on ground transportation, and it's hardwired in our legal docs. And one of the reasons is while technology is kind of there's a crosstalk between aviation and 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 uh, automotive, the standards are different, the decision making process is different, the qualifications for pilots uh, or drivers different. You have mass market versus professionally operated stuff. You have different, let's call it liabilities and accidents. We have different federal, state, and everything else regulations. And so we decided you cannot just go too broad. We need to pick up a domain and try to build intellectual dominance in this particular domain. And so while I'm I'm a big fan and I'm 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 watching big time after VTOL startups, and I'm personally excited, and I would love to fly one of those. It's it's outside of our domain. That's that's kind of first statement. Second, um, again, it's it's our restriction and it's our constraint because who we are, we are two hundred million dollar fund three, and 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 we we write certain size checks. So mm-hmm. as you guys know, hardware is hard. That's why it's called hardware. And, and it's much easier to move uh, electrons than moving atoms. Moving atoms is hard. Electrons, much easier. And so we tend to invest in, I don't say adjacencies, but things definitely relevant for EVs and autonomous driving. We're investing in better edge compute software to, to speed up algorithms. We are investing in... Uh, AI vision system to improve yields and improve quality of the product. We are investing in battery management systems and and over-the-air updates and all sorts of solutions which you can deploy over existing vehicles or the future vehicles. So they're kind of generation agnostic in many cases. And, and, And companies which can launch a product and test the market after first 10 million of investment. And so after 10 million, you have a product on the market and, and it generates revenues and you can talk to the customers and the customers will explain why they selected this product versus something else. And, and, and going back to uh, uh, Volker, uh, investment community is a stack. And so we all, as the companies mature, People talk about value creation milestones. And for example, if if you're a dude running with a presentation, it goes to one bracket. It goes to pre-seed and seed investors. If you're somebody running with a working prototype and a couple of POCs with Audi and Volkswagen, it goes to series A guys. If you have first revenues and you have first five pilot customers generating a couple million bucks or $5 million that go to series B guys, and we're all different. 
and 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 therefore the again the unfortunate reality for many of capital and pen startups is until you really launch and start providing services, it almost doesn't matter. And so you may develop amazing technology. You may deploy five trucks, and 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 Dave, I know the story of Peloton technologies. You you're running it, and then you're trying to convince different fleets to adopt this technology and deploy it for for platooning. But it's it's like from here to there. It's mostly hand waving. And in good market, it's easy to raise, or you can uh, uh, energize people and evangelize people. In bad markets, uh, I think somebody told, I I, I will paraphrase it, but uh, like the God can share his vision, everybody else needs to show me the numbers. And so for everybody else in a bad market, we all need to have numbers to move from point A to point B to point C. And therefore, I'm happy to talk BMS systems and relatively small pieces you can build for 10 million bucks and recognize the revenues. But unfortunately, we are are not leading and we're not charging for those mega super duper capital intense endeavors. And we used to have Big funds and and soft banks of the world and many other uh, mega funds used to invest in this domain, and I think they were again fueling a lot of growth. And now they pulled back, and I'm sure they will come again. It's simply timing is important. And so let me ask you a question. Um, we we we've got a new government now, right? Um, uh, I'm sure we're all energized or whatever because we know. At least, uh, who's going to be the president for a while, and um, and um, for the next two years, we've got we're stuck with whoever we got. I, I I'd like to know um, is that new government going to be pro EV or negative EV, or are they going to throw cash at our situation here, or what do you think is going to happen? Because quite frankly, uh, I mean, they are going to have some kind of influence over whatever is going to happen. So what what do you think they're going to bring to the party? They're clearly pro-EV, clearly pro-EV. They're clearly pro-domestic manufacturing of everything from batteries to battery packs to vehicles to everything. They are definitely introducing different subsidies. And so for the guys who don't have $110,000 or $80,000, and still wants to buy an electric car. Uh, there are multiple government programs. Uh, the the challenge, and 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 I may be wrong, guys. I would I would love to get your opinion. My understanding is, if your startup, like like Aptera or some other guys who are still building manufacturing facilities, and they don't have a product on the market, those subsidies don't qualify for people without a product. Only when you can go and buy the vehicle, you can apply for, I don't know, $5,000 check from federal government and 3,000 from California. You must have a product on the market. Exactly. And during the early Tesla days, uh, Obama administration provided uh, financial support to producers as people were scaling. I'm not sure it's the case anymore. Well, let's hear from Chris Anthony. I mean, he's right in the thick of it. What's going on there, Chris? The thick of it is right. Um, <laughs> hey, we just got a twenty-two million dollar um, uh, assistance package. Um, you know, California is supporting uh, you know the EV um, boom. Uh, they want to have an all-electric vehicle fleet mandate. Only electric vehicles can be sold in California in 2035. Uh, that's going to take a tremendous amount of support. Um, you know, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, um, is heavily incentivizing domestic battery production and other uh, manufacturing of clean technologies. Um, Chris, does the Aptera qualify for any of the IRA stuff? Um, uh, no, seventy five hundred dollars or anything. No electric like that? vehicle on the market today qualifies. For well, I, I know, but let, let, let's say um, I, what I'm wondering, you know, you got a, a two C three wheeler. Is is that going to qualify? 
Uh, r- right now, it doesn't. We hope to have the language expanded uh, to. Uh, so, so even if you had all domestic everything, you still would not get money. Even if we had all domestic, we have to have motorcycle incentives. We're taking. So, do you need that? Do you need them to expand that and get that kind of incentive going? Uh, we would love it. You know, we because we focus on efficiency, we can sell a cost efficient, effective vehicle uh, because we use such a small battery pack to go the same distance as some of these other big EVs. Um, and when you can use a quarter of the battery pack to go the same distance as the other EVs, you pay a quarter of the price. And the battery pack is the most expensive component of a bill, <laughs> bill of materials for an EV. So if you can reduce that battery cost, it's just, you know, bang, bang, bang. You can sell a, a very cost efficient. Okay, and let's get Volker, Volker, same thing. I mean, do you need uh, subsidies to really get your company off the ground? Well, there, are, there are two perspectives in it. And uh, I just want to bring a new word in here. We have to talk more about the customers. People who are looking for an EV, they just look for a price point. If you've already sold something like 80,000, 100, 120,000, and they say, hey, I'm interested in this, but this is not my ballpark. I cannot do this. But uh, I have been in, in programs, you know, I've been CEO to Martin Wintercon some years. And uh, we look as a car industry, how to catch what a customer wants and how to help him to get it. And um, as a, uh, I can see as a European guy who is uh, advising as well, German government on the infrastructure, uh, we have to do more there. So at the moment, it's good that you say you get something like four, six, seven thousand US dollars per car on top of it, but uh, you leave uh, the dealership and then you're looking for a charging point. And uh, this is a big thing. No one, no man is able to buy a car and the decision is made by women. So men are going to the shop, but finally you ask your captain at home, can I buy this? And when the lady says, guy, you can buy it, but we will never drive it because I don't know where to charge. And this is something we learned heavily from, from, from Germany, from Europe. We have to build up now the charging infrastructure because if the charging infrastructure is there, there's hope that you can charge at will and not charge where you have to go to some area and find out if there's a charging pole. It must be like a gasoline station. Okay, uh, we need to charge and I drop out and, and I charge. This is something I'm missing in the actual program. It's a psychological moment that people believe that they're safe with charging. They have to believe it. They have to see it. And there must be a real big rollout of charging infrastructure. It must be cheap, easy to access in the front door somewhere in shopping areas. And it must be something like a privilege to go there. So uh, you have the wheelchair areas and something like two steps right of it. There should be a, a row of you can charge there. You go faster in the shop, you go out there. And uh, even uh, cities here in Germany, <clears throat> It's a little bit like uh, in North Germany is one city. There's been three years, they charge every car which comes there for four euros. And they say, we don't change it. And and full charging, if you go with a Tesla, if you go with a lot sound there, it would be four euros. And they say, we want to have this change in the city. And everyone who's driving an EV is a smart guy because he understood it's cheaper and it's more sustainable for the environment. Things like this make a change. You have a car and a twinkle in the eye and say, I pay less, like more affordable. I could do good for the environment and I do good for my pocket money. There's something like this movement must come. And it's not like only driving and we with high acceleration, crazy like in the Bugatti, uh, your mount, uh, mouth goes back. You can do this. Yeah. And I'm still tickled when three Bugattis, uh, you know, uh, in the North Germany, there's the engineering of, of Bugatti. Three Bugattis are on a public highway overtaking you. Yeah, The flaps at, at the rear going up and down. And like, oh, my God, this is crazy engineering. But the same feeling has to come if you see an EV and an EV driving. People must see it's cool and it's safe. But but to be fair, uh, every legislation favors incumbents because mm-hmm. incumbents are lobbying for legislations and they have enough yeah. might to lobby. And so whenever you see new piece of legislation, clearly the guys who are already selling and shipping and have volume and voice, whether it's in Brussels or in Washington, D.C., it's kind of the same or, or in, in Peking, 
uh, the guys who are in the market have advantages. And they do, but making he, he, life more miserable for startups. Here, here's a question, and Sandy, you, you started to raise it. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, remember, there was not one Republican vote for that. It, it was a pure Democratic one. The Republicans are dead set against it. What if we have a change in administration, a, a party change in 2024? Uh, you know, talking in terms of what it's going to take to get to the checkered flag, whether you're a legacy or a startup, Sandy, you raised the issue here. Uh, are we, as an auto industry, maybe relying too heavily on incentives that with a change of administration could just go away? <laughs> wow, you killed the whole conversation. <laughs> Actually, that is what I was getting after. I mean, um, the money will come if uh, if if it looks like the government's going to be you know, kind of um, at least playing the game, uh, but it it won't come. It definitely won't come if um, if uh, the government is uh, against it. I mean, who's going to invest in something where you're you're positive that Congress, the Senate, the President is going to say, "No, nah, you're not going to get any more. That's it. You're out." No, I, I mean that's where I have a real problem because we don't have that homogeneous stuff that seems to be happening in Europe or China, pretty much anywhere else in the world, where everybody is getting on board. It doesn't matter which party is out there. The only party that really counts is the, is, is, the, is, is, is making sure that, that EVs are, are gonna be the, the next generation of travel. We seem to have this continuous <laughs> rivalry. It's like, I don't watch football anymore because I can't I, I can't take the the stuff in the office that the U of M guys, the state guys, and then oh God, there's an Ohio guy. I mean, they're rah, it's like vicious. So what are we gonna do um to to like uh, calm this savage beast say that 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 we're gonna probably bump into here shortly? What what's the backup plan? I, I mean, everybody everybody on this call is uh, strategic what it, what's the strategic plan if if the government decides to uh, abandon ship what do we do then so what, what what do you think about the analogy between photovoltaics and wind and other forms of electric power so like 10 years ago photovoltaics was way more expensive than anything else you can you can get today uh, uh, industrial scale installations and uh, sea wind is the cheapest form of electricity. So do you think at some point electric vehicle will just start making so much economic sense that the governments don't have to interject at all? It will be a rational decision, whether it's four bucks full charging or you pay a residential price, it's still ROI is clear. You drive electric car. Do you think it it might happen? Yeah, I it's happening right now. So I have I have a Rivian and a and a and a Model Three. So um, um, it was we were we were paying my wife and I were paying probably somewhere around two hundred fifty to three hundred bucks a month for uh, for gasoline. Now we pay nine dollars and eleven cents per month. I mean that's the part that virtually. People don't they they don't they don't really understand how much cheaper it is. They really don't get it. And and actually at my company, if you have an electric vehicle, we have about eight or ten charge uh, ports outside. You charge for free while you're working. That that kind of stuff, I think, and I'm not the only one. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of smaller companies, and they're doing it. They're all doing it right now. This is the kind of stuff that I think will make it happen. But if the mother's milk that comes from the government goes away like instantly, well, that's going to be a real problem until like, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the reserves, the federal reserves for gas, diesel, even uh, even uh, 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 crude, uh, they've all been pretty much depleted. They're almost all gone. They tapped into that so they could drop the uh, drop the uh, the prices of gasoline uh for the next little while uh i i think that when that when the reality comes that uh that gasoline is going to be a lot more expensive than what everybody's anticipated i think that's going to be the other driver but i still worry about what 
what the government might do to uh, to to throw us under the bus. That's that's one of the things that I'm I'm very concerned about, and I'm just kind of curious. What's the strategy if uh, if the government does that? Well, let's uh, switch the conversation a little bit here to you know what the government's going to do. That, that that's beyond the control of any of us here or or any kind of a startup. Uh, Dave, what I'd like to ask you because you've been in so many startups seems to me one of the other issues that are facing everybody, legacy and an EV startup as they transition to EVs is totally different approach to their supply chain. You know, tell us about some of your experience in in what you've gone through because the, the old ways of doing purchasing in the auto industry, I mean, they're gone. Now, now we're yeah. seeing automakers recognizing they they need to know their supply chain far deeper than they ever did in the past. Yeah. Literally going back to mineral extraction. Sure, right. Now, and you hear so much about that right now about you know, just essentially the the rare the the scarcity of the just the raw feedstocks into into all the materials that become part of a car, right? And you know, we heard this. I, I've been hearing this. Sandy, you must have been hearing this for like over a decade or more. But it feels like now we're only getting to the scale that that's starting to come to be a real point of pain. So I think it's like a wake up call, right? I, I to me, I think it's a wake up call. And then, and so there's going to be this massive shift for reshoring. And fundamentally rethinking how they are and how these things get built, and also, um, you know, I guess, kind of more classically down to just kind of great value engineering to tr help try to get to use the things that are actually, you know, just more ubiquitous. Um, we were we were maybe drunk for a long time on uh, low cost labor um, as a as something that was driving cost, um, but in reality you know, that's, that's diminished when you look at the cost of all of the, the intangibles that hit it with, you know, containers being stuck on water, you know, pandemics and, and all the other risks that we face. I, you know, I don't know. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a big question, but I, I, I'm actually kind of glad to see that we're kind of, we dumped out the toolbox and we're all putting it back together now. Um, maybe we can do it a little more, you know, a little more clearly for the, for this particular landscape that we face going forward. Yeah. Chris, let's get your input because, you know, everybody knows about the chip shortage that's going on, but I'm being told it, it, it goes way deeper than that, that if you want to get specialty steels, if you want to get certain components, headlamps, big problem trying to get all that kind of stuff. So again, with this mindset of how do you get to the checkered flag? What are you guys doing from a supply chain standpoint that you can share with the audience? Yeah, the supply chain has been a bit of a nightmare. Um, you know, we, we've had to pre-buy some of our microchips for the Aptera production for, for a whole year worth of production before we've even started production. We won't start production until next year. Uh, but, you know, there's some crazy lead times, you know, 60 months on some chips, uh, which is, you know, I, I think that will well, that will flush itself out over the next year. But, uh, you know, people have to take uh, precautions. Uh, it's also really yanked the price up on some of the base materials for electric vehicles. Uh, rare earth materials, uh, the things that go into our battery packs, uh, just gone crazy. Uh, we don't have, uh, you know, any domestic supply uh, to kind of hedge that out. So we just have to shop the global markets to uh, buy a lot of the things we need. Uh, luckily, we've just signed a, an amazing deal in Europe to produce our carbon fiber uh, body parts. Um, you know, we consider that kind of the the the, the future, um, you know, of, of body structures. Uh, steel and aluminum are built one way, but, uh, you know, composites are just more fungible. They're much more easy to transport. Um, you know, you can you have petroleum refining, you know, all around the world. So you can uh, get the petroleum and, you know, kind of natural carbon fiber that you need to make these parts almost anywhere. Uh, we think that it uh, really is the future of, of lightweight weight uh, vehicles, which will just be a necessity for electric vehicles because the weight is just a huge penalty in your efficiency. Yeah. Is that a risk to you, Chris, to have those, those key components made in Europe where you may have struggle to get them back on shore? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a logistics, um, you know, um, it's a, it's a challenge in logistics in the beginning, but, uh, the, the great thing about, uh, you know, the inflation reduction act and some of these, uh, plans that are coming out of the department of energy and others is we're going to onshore the production of those composite parts over time. Uh, so we're looking to, uh, you know, domesticate, uh, that production, you know, bring jobs back to America and make these beautiful lightweight structures, uh, right here in the States. 
Uh, but to be honest, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, there are countries in like, you can look to Colombia, the last country where China is not investing in lithium mining. You can get part from Europe and you're still part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it's a uh, Dave the point uh, and what we are struggling with, their competences worldwide. Uh, we have to look for to buy in things. I have this European background and a lot of suppliers we're talking at the moment as partners. This is to being built up long time partnerships. Uh, this is our way to, to, to get these parts now. Um, these uh, are somewhere and you have to transport things worldwide. And there's uh, one basic number, it's called working capital. And as a tier one, you have working capital for 30 days. So coming in something and leaving your plant is 30 days. As a car manufacturer, you have to be in the ballpark between 10 or 14 days. If you ship something over an ocean from China, from Europe, you already lost eight days. Yeah. So then in the production, if you're looking for maybe 10, 12 hours of a whole car production, this is quite fast. You have to bring it in and bring it out. It's called just in sequence. This is, uh, this is the magic we are looking in. And uh, Chris, maybe you have to share something as well. We are not looking only for new product engineering. We're looking as well for a new production engineering. We run full greenfield. We are not with this back of like, we have big casting shops. We have these machines light up uh, like, like uh, Henry Ford did it. No, we are running for new engineering concepts for production as well, to have a smaller footprint in the plant as well. It's not only driving the car out there as, as well, have it faster out of the door means less people around there, less storage around there. And all the storage takes space. It's working capital you waste. So uh, if John asks what we are doing different as a new uh, EV car companies, we are not only changing how people can adopt it with cars which are more affordable. We are changing as well how we engineer the product more for less, and we are doing the same in the production. Fully different ways of making cars. And I've uh, done production uh, Excel systems at EW, 6,000 axles going out every day. And I signed with my blood that no one is hurt. This is like a really crazy animal. And we try to stay away from this. And I love Chris's idea. He has only one bearing in there. And he has to look for this. Yeah, this is uh, looking for new product and production engineering principles. This will change. Yeah, lean manufacturing and design for manufacturability is the key to supply chain woes. And, you know, I know a great company in Michigan that uh, is led by literally a god of lean manufacturing. I mean, uh, if you're in, interested in lean manufacturing, go to Monroe and Associates. They will help you out. Uh, gentleman here named Sandy Monroe, uh, he's just the best. Man, I'm telling you, it's the best 50 bucks I ever gave. With. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's something. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, there's another thing. I, I keep going back to the things that I think hold us back. And, and in a lot of cases, that they have to do with the government. And here's the thing that mm, it gets me every time, every time. We talk about how we, we can, we were trying to get this, that, and the next thing. Why don't we look at what we can get rid of? Can anybody think of anything that's so, that's more outdated than side view mirrors, wing mirrors, whatever you want to call them. Do you know, and you know, this is going to be sounding like a love fest here, but do you know that the Aptera has the same drag coefficient <laughs> as the wing mirror on an F-150? How about that? Do you realize how much more effective and efficient we could be if we got rid of those stupid relics and put a couple of cameras in, but we yeah. can't do it. And I'll no, let no. the uh, I'll let the guys that are designing cars right now tell you Sandy, why. To be honest, uh, I did the first serial car with this mirror system, the XL1. Um, this was a small series, only 200, uh, 307 miles per gallon. It was amazing, and there was a lot of American technology. And um, the, the glazing uh, came from uh, fighter cockpits in in US. Um, so it's, it's worldwide traveling there. And um, I've done innovation management in Audi. And some guy said, you have as well a department for standards. They say, yes, we are defining today what the product in the future look like. We are mm -hmm. part of this. 
And when the standard is alive, then someone who makes laws look to it, oh, this is a standard, it's worldwide accepted, then it's a law. In 2014, when I brought the XL1 to the market, there was no country in Germany allowing this mirror. And uh, there are rules, you know, in the Netherlands, every car has to uh, have a trailer hook. This is a joke. But um, I went to the state secretary and she said, you don't have a mirror. And I said, just drive with it. It works like a mirror. It's even better. You don't have to change uh, the angle if yeah. your wife is driving in it or I'm driving in your car. Um, it has so many advantages. We took it from, from fighter planes like the electronics. You can see in the sun, you still see very clear. She said, this is amazing. I vote for it. I went to the, 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 the British state secretary and she said, we have to drive this car. It has, does not have a, a rear mirror. And she said, this is crazy. You have nearly no dead angle there. There are so many advantages. The base point, Sandy, is um, we have to look in what the government can prepare for tomorrow to change certain standards. So um, um, the, the, the side mirror or the, the rear view mirror is, is one example, um, but as well like EVs must have advantages in standards. Yeah. And the, the mirror is this one little thing and the stack coefficients of an F-150, I lived this game. Uh, when I had a big SUV in Germany to go high speed, I just folded the side mirrors in. <laughs> and my wife said, what are you doing? I say, hey, is it, I'm driving so fast. If someone wants to overtake, he made the, uh, the, the light blinking. Uh, I will see it for sure in the, in the center mirror. But uh, just to go smaller there made me five kilometers per hour faster. You can mm. live this. Okay? Yeah, yeah. There well, you go. Look, this government regulation thing is a good issue for us to get into. Not that, you know, we need to all sit around bitching about the government, but nope. it does tie into the this whole theme thing here, too, because, you know, uh, you guys may not remember this, but I sure do. Uh, back in the 1970s, the auto industry had petitioned NHTSA to go from round headlamps to square headlamps. Mm -hmm. It took years, years to make the change. And uh, uh, the head of NHTSA has told me in the past is it takes seven years for NHTSA to implement a new safety standard. And, you know, Sandy, you raised uh, the issue of yeah. the, the outside rear view mirrors. There's headlamp technology that is far more advanced that's available in Europe and China that is not available in the U.S. because it takes so long. Now, you know, we were talking earlier about getting the raw materials needed to be sourced in the U.S. to qualify batteries for the IRA payments. Yeah. Now we have all this permitting of mining that takes something like eight years to get this thing going. So sure. who wants to jump into well, this? Actually, here, here's something. This? Did, Here's something that just this? came from 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 uh, from a government. Canada's kicked three of the. Uh, there's three lithium mines in Canada. I had no not. I didn't know about. Well, they're run or they were owned by the Chinese, and the Canadian government says you're going to have to divest. And I went, holy mackerel! That was a surprise. And then right after that, we had some guys coming in. And one of the other things that's uh, going up faster than the price of lithium is the price of uh, is the price of graphite. And where are we going to get graphite? Oh man, it's a big deal. Well, they burn it. They burn up trees over in China, and then they grind it up. People die of lung disease continuously, and that. But that's what the graphite is. Holy doodle! Ontario's got the when these. Gigantic, you can see it in the satellite view. It's huge. This great big giant area. Where does it go? Well, actually, it goes to China. And then the last thing, I totally blew my mind because the Canadian government was giving me all this crap. There's a town. There's a town in uh, I don't know someplace in Canada. It's called Cobalt. Guess why? Take a guess. <laughs> They were mining cobalt there, but but really what they wanted to extract was the silver that kind of attract you get silver and cobalt at the same, I guess. They were pulling the silver out while the silver went away. They got these big piles of cobalt. They're not doing a damn thing with it. And I'm saying, wait a minute, we've got all these big piles of stuff that we need. It's all available here, and it's only coming to a head because we've decided that it's a good idea if we start to build here. What I don't understand why it was that we didn't see this before, 
But I'm wondering how much um, effort, money, government assistance, whatever we could get to find out what else is sitting here, uh, yeah. you know, ready for the plucking, as it were. So, yeah. I think I can answer to your question. And unfortunately, it goes back to the government. Governments need to decide what they want. Because you can extract cobalt, you can extract lithium, you can you can provide or manufacture carbon, activated carbon. The challenge, especially with lithium and cobalt, those rectification processes to get from the ore uh, uh, to electrochemical grade lithium, which you need for cells, is a very dirty process, and you have to dump a lot of nasty materials in the water, whether you're dumping in the ocean or you need to build massive lean up facilities and, and properly deposit the waste. And so I, I think historically, at least over the last 25, 30 years, the philosophy was, let's dig it out, let's extract it. It's a relatively clean process and we know how to remediate. Let's ship it to China. And let and let's Chinese guys or whoever in South Pacific Asia pollute everything with this crap while they're rectifying those materials, and let them ship it back to us, and we will use it. And so our environment is in good shape, and we're getting low cost products. And it doesn't work anymore. And I think somebody needs to say, okay, what's more important? Are we willing to uh, pay more because you need to? produce it in a clean fashion. You cannot dump it in the river and kill kill all the turtles and fish. Or, or you know what, for our long-term security, we're willing to compromise on EPA regulations and compromise on exhaust in, in the atmosphere and around here, but we'll be producing domestically. And it's, it's a political decision. And it's like, are we burning coal or we're not burning coal? It's a it's a political decision. And or, I don't or is this how point. subsidies have to change? Do, do we need to divert some of these subsidies into being able to mine and process in a clean way? It's it's getting mined today. What what you will see a lot of as as Sandy you just mentioned, this lithium ore is is extracted in not extracted but dug in Canada. Same is happening in the states. United States is producing a lot of ore. But it's too expensive and too EPA compliant difficult to turn this ore into end product on U.S. soil in North America. And we, we pollute elsewhere, not in our backyard. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, these intangibles um, start to become tangible all of a sudden yep. in that world, right? So the, the cost wasn't really clear to us, the, tr the true cost. And then as we have to start to figure out how to do that in a way, these are trade-offs. And, and unfortunately, there's time constants involved in this. So you, it's hard to make this stuff happen fast unless there's a real dr driven um, if, uh, demand like we're starting to see. So maybe we will get we will get smarter at this. I mean, there was no reason to do RMA vaccines in 2019, but we figured it out in 2020, didn't we? Right. So, um, I mean, that's the kind of wake up call I think we're going to. I think we're starting to see, I hope. And, um, and, and you know, that's just going to keep us all on our toes. Yeah, but the end, we are in capitalism. So uh, the customer is looking for a product, uh, sees a fair price. And at the end of the day, you can decide to go to a nice vacation with your children in summer or you buy an AV. And to be honest, uh, as a father of four children, I would say I go with my children for vacation because I want to show them the world. So the overall level perspective is uh, if the government wants to do something here is like help this new technology rise and say, uh, as we've done it in Europe uh, with windmills, with solar energies, uh, these huge programs, you get uh, grants for setting up this new technology. And uh, then it comes with less um, impact for environment, less impact to the pocket um, of the customer to the market. This could make a change. Well, and our cars, yeah. our cars, we say we do it from America for for America. So we want to stay local because this uh, supply chain is as well like polluting a lot. 
So if you see uh, the recycled product goes from California to Ohio and then it's dumped in Mexico, it's crazy. So we have done this tracing uh, with, with, uh, with this dump as well. And we have to look credit to grade to the whole process. At the moment, we're talking about producing the energy, producing the car, driving the car. And at the end of the day, you have these huge batteries there and you can do that like second use, make like UIA is doing this, put in front of the headquarter and have an energy storage. But how many energy storages you want to build out of cars? We were and actively the- looking at reuse and recycle. I think it's a huge area for batteries. Exactly. Sure. To have closed economy, huge area. It's a game changer, for, especially yeah. for prices. JB figured that out. JB, had, you know, he, he saw this and uh, a long time ago, we talked about it, he and I. And, um, and you, know, re, you know, Redwood Materials is that, right? And, you know, it's, he's making it happen. Yeah, yeah. but uh, there are different ways to do this. And uh, there are some mannequin, mechanical ways to, to grind these batteries, get it off. And uh, at the end, you have to look in the process how you made it. So there are 17 ways to destroy things from nuclear to mechanical impact to corrosion, electric, so different ways. But if you put something together by a water solution process, electrical process, you have to break it up the same way. It's like if you have a tool and fix something, you have to use the same tool to unlock it again. And uh, this process is, uh, there are only two startups worldwide who are in this electrochemical dissolution process of a battery. So this mechanical grinding at the end, it's like all broken down. Uh, and then you have to process it again in an electrochemical way. But if you start uh, this reverse production, uh, this gets a lot of more efficient. But this is something like John, the, the government could help. So. Um, I'm changing to US with my with my work visa now. Uh, exactly, I bought the flight uh, bought the flight in, in in 12 hours, and then I have to live in the United States. But I still have this uh, European thinking: how we help certain technology fields to evolve, and then let it go to the market. And some guys like Alexei say this is a cool technology. Government says this is cool. Some grants behind it, and it will be capitalism. This is how the system works. And yeah, Dave, you said it as well. If we want to do it, we are able to do it, but it must be at the end of business case. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, um, I was a toolmaker prior to becoming an engineer. And uh, the very first project that I worked on was uh, for a company called Century Spray. And our job was to clean up uh, polluters. And the biggest polluter in North America used to be the mines in Sudbury. Uh, If you ever went up in the 60s when I was a kid, if you went to Sudbury, there were no trees. There was no grass. There was no nothing. Everybody had asthma. It was a hellhole. But if you go up now, you don't see any of that stuff. And the reason for that is because we developed uh, equipment to take the horrible crap, mostly sulfuric acid, out of the air and and figured out how to actually turn it into money. That, and in fact, when we first put up the, the air cleaners that went on to the towers, we found out that uh, after we had them on for a while, the big canisters that were at the bottom, so it, it basically it just swings around like a <coughs> like a tornado inside, And it's water. And what happens is the smoke goes in, the water traps it, uh, and then uh, the sludge goes down into these big pots. And our job was to bring these big pots back to to the factory. And then we'd go through it and find out what might be available to us. And one of the things we found in there, and it was about 1% of the weight of it, was gold. (laughs) <laughs> we lost that contract instantly. Some fool went and told the people at uh, at uh, Sudbury Mines that we were finding gold in the sludge, and that was the end of that. These guys took it over, and then they bought more pollution control stuff because there's always some sort of added benefit when you when you do something that's that's worthwhile. So that one was the first one, but then every car company, every foundry, everybody started putting that same sort of pollution control equipment on their on their chimneys and whatnot, and we wound up with a much better world. I think that if we start looking at these incredibly nasty, and I do know they're nasty, 
uh, operations that have to come on for lithium, cobalt, uh, 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 what do you call it, graphite. All these things, there's got to be a better way of, uh, of processing. And I'm pretty sure that there's enough brains in this country to, uh, to figure out what we have to do in order to get the job done. So I, I think that there's, there's a solution, and I don't think it's going to be something that'd be impossible. I just think somebody has to click, turn the key, and, uh, and uh, there'll be just as many people that are working on electric vehicles could work on how do we refine uh, so that you know, we don't kill all the turtles and the fish. Uh, well, not all of them, maybe a couple. Hey, hey guys, we're, we're, we're down to uh, the last part of this uh, conversation here. We've got quite a few questions coming in from the audience. Why don't we go sort of, you know, rapid fire here and uh, round out the, the rest of this conversation with questions from the audience. And so with that, Chris, we're starting with you. You got a question from George Saloon. He wants to know, how did you get the dollars from California that you mentioned? George, thank you. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of grant um, possibilities out there, depending on what you're doing. Um, you know, California is uh, highly incentivizing um, uh, electric vehicle technologies and uh, clean technologies uh, in general, um, you know, energy creation and distribution technologies. Uh, so it's really just finding a grant that uh, could work for whatever uh, your company is doing and then uh, go after it and apply for it. Um, this, uh, um, you know, this effort can be complex and it can be expensive and you have to maybe rally a lot of uh, people in support, uh, but it uh, but it is effective and uh, can get you uh, a lot of uh, financial support. Okay, Craig, uh, and uh, Chris, uh, a follow-up from Craig Dawkins. He wants to know, when are you going to ship the first app, Tara? Is it going to be the third quarter of 23? And how are you going to navigate the states that do not allow direct sales? Well, Sandy wants this one. So, um, you know, <laughs> we can... Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> we could uh, we we could ship now. We're, we're technically a federal motor vehicle manufacturer. Uh, we could sell the vehicles that we have on the floor. Uh, you know, if you build, you're building an auto cycle, it's a self certification. So, uh, but there's a lot of work uh, for us to still do. Uh, we're about to pin our production design uh, with Sandy's help, a very manufacturable design. Uh, but then we have to go through uh, validation and uh, you know ramping up our uh, manufacturing facilities, getting all the equipment and tooling needed to do that. So, um, unfortunately, the uh, the exact time of the first delivery is funding dependent. Um, so Alexis, uh, you know, funding dependent uh, that uh, if, if he could help us uh, find those big dollars to buy that tooling and equipment, uh, that would be great. But uh, that, you know, our that's how right we kicked off about, this whole conversation. You got to get the money. It's about nine months for us, you know, from the time we start deploying capital to when we start to uh, deliver uh, vehicles and ramp up our manufacturing line. So uh, very quick in automotive terms, but, uh, you know, we we still uh, we still have a ways to go. Okay, next one. Volker, I'm going to throw this to you because you I think you addressed this point earlier. Gordon Neeson wants to know, won't EVs pass the tipping point where they don't need the government movie to move money to move forward because the value's there? He points out that uh photovoltaic cells and wind is crushing coal because it's cheaper, not just because it's greener. Yeah. So Gordon, good question. So the tipping point, uh, you have seen statistics there and the big markets like uh, China, they make a move there already. Uh, they're at 3%. Um, it's a huge market. So a lot of um, absolute cars going there. Um, you have the tipping points already reached uh, in, in Europe. And uh, this brings us that the whole industry behind it. So the supply chain partners, the engineering partners, they change their business to EVs. So it gets more, more affordable. Uh, to get these components for a car maker. And this makes this avalanche going faster. So the tipping point will come. It's not there. There are different markets which are more or less close to this. And uh, I would say uh, numbering this like it's Europe, China, and then US at the moment. But uh, with, with some help, as you talk, John, uh, we get this uh, US avalanche of EVs going faster. And if I look to product I've seen here today, um, different ones like uh, Chris Mine. Uh, this will be a game changer. It will come. Okay, th this one I'm just going to throw out. Whoever wants to go for it, Michael Kerman wants to know what's the potential of lithium from the Salton Sea. 
Uh, we live right by the Salton Sea, so I can tell you it's uh, pretty tremendous. It's one of the largest uh, lithium deposits in North America. Uh, the problem is uh, you have to liquefy it and refine it. Uh, they're starting to build plants out there now. Um, you know, is it going to uh, take years or decades? I hope it takes years. Um, you know, unfortunately, the California side is uh, regulatory heavy. Um, so we hope uh, that, you know, a lot of these projects, I know of four of them uh, off the top of my head uh, that are getting going. So uh, hopefully we can, you know, lithium is one of the most abundant <laughs> elements in our planet's crust. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we get a lot of new technology over the next decade that can that can extract it efficiently and put it in uh, things like our beautiful electric vehicle here. Well, Thank actually, uh, there's another thing that's happened. Uh, I was in Japan uh, last week and um, in the uh, uh, Japan Times, there was an article about how uh, lithium actually at uh, certain depths in the ocean drops out of solution and it just glues itself to the bottom. So at 3,000 meters, um, they've got ships now that are going down and somehow extracting this and bringing it back up. This couldn't possibly be with suction. It's got to be some mechanical Ferris wheel or something that uh, that goes down, picks it up, and brings it back up the other side of the tube. But the Japanese are already working on it um, right now. So that's, that's, cool. that's happening. Well, that ties in perfectly. And I don't know if you want to take this, Sandy, or if anyone else wants to jump in as well. Nathan Bendel wants to know, would ocean mining work or is it just going to cause more problems to the environment? No, well, the answer is yes. And I just explained how. So yeah, we, we'll get more answers this way or more questions in. Go. Anyone else? So we, we are mining in the ocean only on the surface. So I know uh, getting manganese uh, out of the Pacific Ocean 40 years ago, and there's so much in there. Uh, but as we have talked earlier, we can start this new technology, this new business now like environment neutral. And this would be a game changer to start these new technologies, not only for capitalism to have access to this material, but do it in a better way in the long term for the environment. Yeah, there's some very interesting things uh, it's just sitting on the floor of the Pacific Ocean, you know, what they call polymetallic nodules that are, I, I mean, it's NMC, right? It, it's nickel, it's manganese, it's cobalt right in one rock. You just pick it up, but very controversial because, uh, you know, people don't like to hear about mining in the ocean. Okay, next one. Uh, Jake Krakauer wants to know, what's the potential of hydrogen for vehicle power? And is it technically or economically feasible? I can take this one. I've been flip-flopping. I had multiple backs and forths. And so uh, I was highly skeptical about before six months ago. And so if you look at hydrogen extraction and storage, you store at high pressure or very low temperature, and it's running away, and you have smaller molecules, and you try to do uh, fuel cells, and, and if you look at the numbers, and I'm a physicist by training, if you start looking at electrochemistry and, and energy density of hydrogen, I was highly skeptical. And I changed my mind about six months ago. And the reason why you have uh, two types of hydrogen you can buy, at least in Europe. One of them is blue hydrogen, and one is a green hydrogen. And the blue hydrogen is something you produce through normal chemical process like refineries. You can run refinery and, and suck in natural gas and, and do some cracking, uh, catalyst cracking and end up with hydrogen. And so if you look at the balance of energy, what you need to spend to refine ethanol or methanol or methane, ethane, and into hydrogen, it's just highly questionable. And so I couldn't figure out why it makes sense. However, what I learned is you have an emergence of green hydrogen in Europe because the most, if you, if you look at windmills in, in North Sea, the wind blows in the middle of the night and you have excessive production of electric energy and you don't know, you don't know what to do with it. And so how do you store energy? One way to store energy is to build batteries Another way to store energy is to electrolyze water and have hydrogen and oxygen. And this hydrogen can be burned, it can be mixed, and you burn it in the stove and 20% ratio, or you can store it and use it to fuel the car. And the conversion efficiency is shockingly high. 
for this green cottager. And so my, my take is for a mainstream application, you probably will not be able to produce enough hydrogen in a meaningful way, in a green way. But for fleet use cases and for some niche use cases, I think hydrogen is uh, for real, especially for long haul trucking, where you can have hydrogen stations on both ends of the route and where you're getting those hydrogen through electrolysis, not through cracking and refining on, of natural gas. I agree. Yeah, a great long, way long haul trucking. I 100% agree. Long haul trucking, for sure. Yep, that's, where the big, that's where the big opportunity is. I know that no one wants to use the word Nikola anymore, but uh, but I'm telling you flat, they've got the right idea. It's the best application for hydrogen. Yeah. Putting it in anywhere else, it's just another hybrid and a waste of money and time. Yeah, the, the best description I heard is if a vehicle has a gasoline engine in it, it's going to go battery electric. If it's got a diesel, it's going to go hydrogen fuel cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Alexi, this one comes back to you. Um, Aaron Redis, I hope I said your last name right there, Aaron. He says, it seems everywhere you look, there's a new EV startup. Most will fail. But as an investor, Alexi, what do you look for to pick out the diamonds in the rough that have a higher chance of success? Yeah, uh, Elon Musk and D-Lab, I think you guys used to, used to have events at, at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And so there's a famous uh, presentation uh, by Peter Thiel in the School of Engineering, which talks about uh, efficient markets and inefficient markets. And so you can find uh, a lecture written somewhere and post it on the internet. Fascinating thoughts. But some of the thoughts are, you actually don't want to be in an efficient market because it's very, very hard to make money in an efficient market because everyone can compete and, and your marginal revenues are equal marginal costs. And so if you think about us looking for, to, to make an investment, we are looking for great markets and, and electrification is clearly the right market to bet on. We're looking at, at fundamentally powerful and engaged and committed teams. And so we're looking for entrepreneurs and people mentioned Elon Musk several times and somebody who can steamroll reality and have reality distortion field and 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 make things happen. And so he's he's probably the most famous one, but he's not the only one. And but the number three, we're looking for some fundamental competitive advantages and long uh, long term competitive advantages. And in some cases, uh, it can be technology, it can be technological edge. In some cases, it can be access to certain resources hard to get like somebody has arrangement with battery plant or somebody managed to get access to a factory uh, uh, which can manufacture vehicles. And so you don't need to build a brand new factory. You can run on somebody else's factory or, or some sort of things, unique things, hard to get, hard to reproduce and something which will save you a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, uh, bringing technology from kind of inception into production. Or maybe you have a special use case. Maybe you manage to lend USPS as a customer. Or maybe Amazon is willing to give you volume, and so they will be running the lorries. Or you have tuk-tuk rickshaws and, and last-mile delivery use case, and, and the largest last-mile delivery player suddenly wants to partner with you because your vehicle is specifically tailored for this particular use case, and you have significant like advantages day number one. And so that's what we're looking for. The market is there, team is there, and it is how to build something unique, which you can bring into production relatively quickly and hopefully rely uh, as little as possible on government subsidies. Because generically, you want to avoid it. I'm not sure we can avoid it in every single case. Well, Alexei, I think you just summed up the whole thing perfectly there with your answer. And, and we're at the end of our time, so we're going to have to wrap this up. There, there are actually a lot more questions, so I apologize to those who posted their questions, but we're out of time. i got to tell you, it was a thrill to be with all of you, to, and uh, we're going to have to wrap this up now. And uh, Nathan, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you all so much. What an amazing panel. Um, we all learned so much, and I wish we could have you for even longer, but I know some of you are calling in from the other side of the world. So thank you so much for joining. And um, 
Really appreciate it. So one quick plug and um, before we go. So I think um, you you heard in my opening that we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and, you know, I wanted to answer one question very quickly. So where can you get to the um, video recording of this? It'll be up probably in about a week. Um, we will link to it off of vlab.org. We have a whole YouTube channel linked there under past event videos that you can peruse for other exciting topics. Um, we meet, we're all volunteers, so we meet on the first Tuesday of every month, um, and you can find the meetup link also on vlab.org. Um, and then finally, uh, we are an entirely uh, donation-based organization. We still have some costs. We're very lean and mean, but if you enjoyed the event and you didn't donate when you signed up, please do go to vlab.org forward slash donate and you'll be re redirected to our donation processing service. So thank you all and have a wonderful night. Appreciate um, this amazing event and for all the hard work that everyone did to make it happen.